Hey, this is a round two of cooking with Jessie. <laughs> um, yeah, this is the second cooking. The last one I did was about broad beans and this one is about something else that a lot of people are not that convinced about. Chart. Now, you know, I'm utterly convinced about chard and I think it is one of the finest things that we can grow. I love it because it's so versatile. No. No. What? Okay, let's start that again. Yeah, so chard. You know how much I love chard. I go on about chard all the time, but I just think it is a fantastic vegetable and it is so versatile and so reliable, so easy to grow. You can have it all year round. I mean, what's not to love about that? I grow quite a few different varieties of it. This year I'm not growing the peppermint chard, which is the one with the really bright, bright pink and white stripy stems, just because I couldn't get hold of any seed in time. But I am growing um, Lucullus, Ford Hook Giant, Bietta, Rainbow, and something else that I can't remember. I'm also growing perpetual spinach, which is also a chard. But what I'm actually using up today is the very last of last winter's Lucullus and a little bit of really tiny Ford Hook Giant that never really got going because these were things that were in the covered bed over winter. I planted them a little bit too late for them to be really good croppers over winter, but what it meant was that then we got a really early crop in spring. So timing didn't really work out for what I was planning in the winter, but it's worked out really well for now. But this does mean that this is the last bit of chard I'm going to be cooking with for a good couple of months because I've only just got the new lot in, which is going to be for the late summer. The two that I'm using today, this is um, the last little remnants of some Ford Hook Giant that I had that had gone to seed, so it bolted, so the leaves are quite tiny. And then I'm also using the Lucullus, which as you can see is a really much paler, paler leaf. This also cooks down a lot more than some of the more robust chards. So I would treat the Lucullus chard a little bit more like the perpetual spinach type chard, where you need to have really quite a lot of it because as soon as you cook it, it, it shrinks down a lot and it's a much softer chard. Whereas some of the more robust ones, you know when you get the really huge rainbow chard leaves and that sort of thing, Fort Hook Giant as well, when they've got like the really tough meaty leaves, you can afford to get away with a little bit less because they don't cook down quite so much. But anyway, I'm using about a 50-50 split of Lucullus and old Fort Hook Giant. And the first thing that I've done with it is take the spine out. So I, you've heard me say this before, I know you have, but one of the things that I have notice that people don't like is the really earthy taste of chard and chard is just basically the same plant as beetroot but it doesn't grow the beetroot it's just the top growth and so the, the stems do have that sort of vaguely earthy flavor that you get with beetroot so not really strong but it's that sort of flavor the leaves on the other hand are something else i don't particularly like the stems i've got to own up to it i just don't really like that flavor i love beetroot but not really uh, cooked down the way that it does with the chard. So, mm. so the first thing is always to strip out the rib for me. You can, if you like the stems, you can cook them any other way. Like sometimes I have cooked them up with asparagus, just, you know, like long strips of them and they're pretty delicious with a load of butter over the top. Most things are delicious with butter over the top to be fair, but they are really nice, but I don't like them mixed with the leaves. I like to treat them like two separate vegetables. And so all you do is you turn the leaf. So you've got the front side of the leaf, back side of the leaf, you go back side up and fold the leaf down and then you just pinch it out and strip your leaf. So you end up with this sort of shebang. So this is now a whole bowl of chard that has been stripped off its stem. So it's just the leaf part. And you've heard me talk about my love of chard lasagna before. I've gone on and on and on about it and there is a blog post on my website which I will stick above my head somewhere around here. I can never remember what side it's on. I'll stick a link to that post which is the basic chard lasagna recipe which is a joy. But I'm going to mix it up a bit today. You've seen me talk about the chard lasagna and you've had my recipe for absolutely ages and I'm going to do basically the same thing. So if you're looking to make a chard lasagna you can follow this what I'm doing today 
almost to the T and I'll go through the steps which make it into a lasagna rather than what I'm making. But I'm making something slightly different today and and the difference is going to be in the pasta. So instead of using sheets, lasagna sheets, I'm going to be using conchiglioni. First things first, get a large pan of water on the boil. So these conchiglioni are one of the things that I always have in the cupboard because yes it's just a pasta shape and it's just hard pasta you know they store I wouldn't say forever but for a pretty long time but they're just so handy because basically almost any leftovers you've got left over you know what I mean any leftovers so versatile just parboil the pasta shells like I'm about to do now Stuff it in there, a bit of cheese sauce or some kind of complimentary sauce over the top. Stick it in the oven. Really, really good. But none of the ways I've tried have beaten than just with chard and mozzarella because it is a fine, fine combination. So while I'm waiting for that big pot of water to boil, I am going to start on the two sauces. So it's a tomato sauce and a bechamel sauce. Uh, both really simple. The tomato sauce is just onions, garlic, tomatoes and then a bit of salt. That's pretty much it. If you wanna add a bay leaf in there, you can. If you want to add some basil in there, you can. Anything that you wanna to do to pick up, a bit of chili would be nice. But the basic is just one onion, two cloves of garlic, and either a can of chopped tomatoes, or I'm gonna be using some of our tomatoes from last year. Will you be quiet, Annie? I won't bother kicking him out of the kitchen because I think I'm about to do some of that, you know, like sped up music stuff. I know I said one onion, but actually I've only got these two quite diddy ones in there. So I'm going to use two small onions, but generally, you know, like a normal size onion, just one of them will be fine. Also, I know at least half of my audience this isn't going to be relevant for, but onions and eyeliner, not a good combo. Ooh. Oh dear. <laughs> glamour. It's all glamour. Right, after all the emotion of cutting those onions, the water is now boiling. So. I'm going to use the same pot of water for the pasta and the chard. I'm going to do the chard first because if you do the pasta, it gets all a bit pasta -y, you know, like uh, milky. You don't want any of that. So you want to do the chard first and it's just going to be a case of like two, three minutes. You just want it to wilt down. Thank you. 
And then you want to just fill up this bowl with cold water and rinse it out a couple of times so that the chard is properly cold. Next up, I'm gonna put the shells just straight into that water. It might look really bright green, but it's absolutely fine, but I'm now gonna add some salt. So no salt before I put the chard in, but salt before I put the pasta in. Um, so I don't know, I mean, everybody has a different sort of portion size. I tend to do five shells per person. They look pretty tiny when they're like this, but when they've been cooked, they kind of get a little bit larger. And when they're stuffed, they're really quite big. So. I mean, it could be, you could be more of a four shells kind of person. You could be a six shells kind of person. I'm not sure, but um, I'm going to do five each. And it's only mum and I having lunch. So that's 10 shells. God, my maths is good. Okay, back to the sauce. So garlic. Depends how much garlic you like really. I'm just going to use two cloves. tomatoes or in my case we've got some frozen ones left over from last year so I'm going to throw them in as soon as that's kind of gone translucent soft. Mine is a little bit uh, on the dark side in patches because I was faffing around with the camera so uh, yeah just ignore the dark bits and it'll be fine. It's flavour, adds flavour. Okay so we freeze our tomatoes like at the end of the year when we've kind of just got masses of them particularly the ones that are really massive beefy ones like the Japanese black trefelli or the black Russian, any of those really beefy ones. Also Waldex was another one last year that was huge. We just either chop them up or we put them through the really thick grind on the moule, which just takes all the skins off them, but kind of all the pulp and bits and pieces of the insides of the tomatoes go straight through. And we actually feed them in bags. So like this one, this is defrosted now, obviously, but we just kind of put it in there and then we freeze them flat. Actually, I'll show you with a tomato soup one. The bags are reusable. As you can see, it's totally like held its integrity. So uh, once I've used these, I'll just rinse the bag out and we can reuse them. But like we freeze them flat. Like this is a um, tomato and basil soup from last year. Freeze them flat. And it just means that you can like stack them in the freezer. Because one of the things I always find when you are growing your own and you've got a glut and you make loads of stuff to store, but it's like... How do you store it? It just take, it takes up so much space. And like for a couple of years now, we have just had bags and bags and bags of courgette soup, like uh, chopped marrow, Indian spinach, tomato soup, tomato puree, chopped tomatoes, you know, just loads of that. But if you freeze them flat in like a 400, just a standard like can size, you kind of know what you've got in there. Everything's labeled and it stacks really neatly, so. Yeah, and, and like I say, these bags, they are reusable, uh, which is quite handy because it would just be ludicrous to just be throwing them out every time. But yeah, they, they hold their integrity really well. The only thing you've got to watch out for is when they are frozen, they're quite delicate. So uh, if I was just going to try and defrost that soup now and I cracked, because you can just crack it open and use it, then you rip the bag because it's still frozen. But if you let them sort of gently defrost, then the bags survive. Okay, let's see if I've burnt the onion anymore. Only a little bit.
nice. Now I'm just going to wait for the tomato and onion and garlic to kind of cook down a bit um, and I'll add a bit of salt. It's just going to be really plain. I, I, don't, I want the star of the show to be the chard, to be perfectly honest, and the mozzarella. So the pasta is out. Uh, it's just cooling down. You want to keep it in the water because otherwise it starts to dry out and then it gets dif more difficult to manipulate. So just keep that in the water. I'm going to wait for this to cook out. And then on top of it goes a bechamel sauce, exactly like you would in a normal lasagna. And I'm going to probably get on with that now as well. And obviously, I mean, a bechamel sauce. It is just butter and flour, added milk, bit of nutmeg. I'm not actually going to add any cheese to this. If you were doing it for a cauliflower cheese or something like that, obviously you would put cheese in the sauce. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to sprinkle uh, Parmesan over the top. So as soon as that is melted, but not bubbling, I will stick a tablespoon of plain flour in there. Not laying flour, plain flour. is a bit of nutmeg. Okay, we've got ourselves a red sauce, a white sauce, some chard, some mozzarella, some cooked pasta shells, and a bit of Parmesan to go over the top. Let's stick it together. putting the tomato sauce straight into the base of the dish that you're going to set those shells on. I always re recommend doing it this way around so that you fill the shells first before you put the tomato sauce in because because if you put the tomato sauce in first and then you start as you're filling each shell you put it in there and then you realize that you needed to fill them with less or whatever you don't have enough filling taking them out of the tomato sauce and trying to redo them again is a messy business you're much better off kind of filling them separately then get the tomato sauce in and then lay them just straight on top of the tomato sauce. So if you need to make any adjustments, you can make them without them being a sort of a tomato horror show. So in terms of if you were making this a classic lasagna, you'd put half the tomato on the bottom and then keep half of it. It would be a layer of tomato sauce, then a layer of pasta pre-cooked like those shells. Then you would put your mozzarella and chard mix in the center, just in one thick wedge. More pasta on top, then the tomato sauce on top of that. So you're kind of sealing it in a sandwich and then it would be the bechamel sauce. 
The reason that I like to put the chard and the mozzarella just in one big wedge rather than mixing it through is that you can retain quite a lot of structure to the lasagna. Sometimes I find with vegetable lasagnas, which I do love vegetable lasagna, don't get me wrong, but sometimes they're a bit kind of like, like floppy. And if you can really keep that chard in there, you get a really good flavour of the chard because chard and mozzarella is one of the finest things known to man. And getting that really big wedge is really nice. Same way with this, you're getting them in really large kind of chunks rather than it being kind of spread throughout the tomato and bechamel. Let's stick it in the oven. Okay, that is gonna be in there for about 20 minutes. Everything's already cooked, pretty much. The pasta's not totally cooked, but it, all you're waiting for is for the top to start bubbling and going slightly brown and then it's time to eat it. saying about five shells each as kind of a portion well actually we only managed three shells each so um, I was way out there but it does mean we got lunch for tomorrow which is handy and uh, yeah that is about it guys I'm gonna finish this glass of wine and I will see you on Tuesday cheers there's not much left in there is there <laughs>